Now if we have a lot of information set up in some table somewhere, we can often use that to find out the missing piece of information we didn't have, especially when we're talking about things like energy. Because energy, we know, often, especially in chemistry, is going to be a path-independent function, which means that we can convert into some sort of an energy unit. We can then use equations to convert that energy into uh, some other uh, arbitrary scale, and then we can convert between different reactions and find what the total energy change would be. Well, that's exactly what we're going to see here uh, when we do things like a Latimer diagram. So a Latimer diagram, effectively what they're going to do, we're not going to worry about the math on this. They convert the number of electrons and the uh, E naught for an expression, they convert that back into a Gibbs free energy uh, number, so the standard free energy change. And then we can say, hey, great, and because we know that for this piece of a reaction, we can take that into the next reaction, and then we can do blah, blah, blah. Well, if you go through the whole derivation for the process, things simplify down, and we end up getting uh, an approach that we can use going through one of these sort of diagrams. What I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through the step-by-step -step approach to using or constructing a Latimer diagram. Now, when we're talking about reduction and oxidation processes, our first step is almost always to figure out what our oxidation numbers are. And if it's not our first step, it's probably the second step. So let's go ahead and determine the oxidation number for all these species. Let's go ahead and use this as one of our stop, try it, then check back in problems. Go ahead and do that now. Okay, so let's go ahead and start here with IO4 minus. O is always a minus 2. So negative 2 oxidation number. It's going to have 4 of them, giving me a total of negative 8 for its contribution. So something minus 8 equals minus 1. That means that this is going to be a plus 7 oxidation number for iodine. Let's go ahead and just scribble that out since we only care about the iodine for this. We're going to come to the other side and say, same idea, negative 2. There's three of them. That's a negative six overall. Something minus six equals minus one. So that's going to be five. Five minus six equals negative one. That seems correct to me. So let's go ahead and put those oxidation numbers in. Put them in parentheses. Here we are. Then for this next one, notice we have the exact same species. So that one's pretty straightforward. We're at plus five for the iodine. Come over to this one. This is the elemental form. This will be a zero oxidation number. Again, I'll remind us we don't care about stoichiometry when we figure those out. We can come down here and say, hey, look, yet again, something that we already figured out. So that saves us from that. Now, this one would be a little bit harder for us to figure out, possibly, but let's just take a look at things. Let's say that we don't care too much about structure. Let's do it using just the rules. We know oxygen is always a minus 2. Hydrogen is always a plus 1 when it's paired up with uh, non-metals. So overall this is going to be plus 1 minus 2. So I'm currently at minus 1 overall and that has to equal 0. So iodine is going to be a plus 1 in this form. We get down here and it's still a plus 1. I come back over to here and we say yep I've seen that one before. 0. Then we're going to come down here to the very bottom and I'm going to go ahead and write it above since I'm out of space. This would still be a zero oxidation state since it's the elemental form. Come over to this one where I minus one. If it's a single ion like that, monatomic, we just look at that and say, right, you keep your original charge as your oxidation number. So we can see that we really have a range of oxidation numbers here for our iodine species. We're going from plus seven through plus five, plus one, zero, and minus one. So there's quite a few different options there. Now if we were to stitch all those together, we can kind of start putting them in sequence like this. The next thing we can do is we can go ahead and just put on an arrow for each of these connections. Now what we're showing right above each arrow is the E naught that we would have for it. So this is basically a map of all those reactions. Now, this is obviously not a reaction. It's completely unbalanced. What it is is it's just kind of a map to help us see how we get from IO4 minus to IO3 minus 
to HOI to I2 and all the way to I minus. All right, so we have all these in. We've got our little side reaction here showing that not only can we do it like this, we can also just follow this existing reaction straight from IO3 minus to I2. So all of these should end up being consistent. Well, it turns out if we go through that whole Gibbs energy calculation, etc., we find out that we can use this formula in order to get from one to another. Now, n here is going to be the number of electrons that we were using to get from one to another. Notice we actually have to look at the oxidation numbers to determine that piece. So we are going to use that as our n. We're going to use E0. We're going to take the sum of those divided by the total number of electrons that were used in the process, and that'll give us the overall E0 for the process. So let's go ahead and determine what E0 would be for a reaction going from IO3 minus directly to I minus. All right, so we can see here, there's a few ways for us to do that. I could use this one and this one and this one. Or recognizing it's path independent, I can say, yeah, but this one has even fewer calculations to do. So let's go ahead and do it going from IO3 minus to I2, and then from I2 to I minus. So you can see here that what we're going to say, I have five electrons in order to get this far along my reaction. And I know that because I go from five oxidation number down to zero. E naught for that process was 1.210. Then my other one is going to be, let's see, one electron, and that's going to be 0 0.535. So I'm going to multiply those and add them. So I'll have 5 times 1.210 plus 1 times 0.535. So I've got my 6.585. Now I'm going to divide that by the total number of electrons to get the whole way along. And I see that that number is going to be 6, 5 and 1. So that'll be divided by 6. So I anticipate that my E0 overall will be 1.098 for this process. But let's always try to keep rigor. Badgers, donkeys, volts. We want to make sure we keep a unit on that number. So don't lose sight of what you're working with whenever you're doing your work.